guy, Barry from England, right? He asked me to ask a question. And his question was, um, do you believe that any of the oral law was given at Sinai? Do I believe any of the oral law was given on Sinai? Personally, uh, I don't. No. All right. I mean, think about it this way. Um, there was many times in the Torah where it clearly says that they asked Moses a question. Moses didn't have the answer, so Moses had to go back up and ask God. Right. Mm -hmm. And those laws were considered part of the written law. In other words, right. we say quite loosely that the whole Torah was given on Sinai. But if you ask the average Orthodox Jew, he really doesn't necessarily believe that. Because mm -hmm. it seems that the transmission began on Mount Sinai and continued all through the desert. Right. Moses kept giving them laws. Now, the Ten Statements, what people call the Ten Commandments, is what was specifically given in Harsinai. But not every mm -hmm. commandment. Right. Like Courtney said, it was a progression in Revelation that ended with the end of Deuteronomy. For example, somebody on Facebook today posted a Chabad article justifying the oral law from the five books of Moses. Not once did Chabad.org ever mention the notion of a Sanhedrin or a quarter or elders. Mm -hmm. But the Kabbalistic idea, as Nehemiah Gordon claims that Orthodox Jews believe, that the whole Talmud was given on Mount Sinai. That's quite idiotic. The Rambam didn't believe this. The sages in the Talmud didn't believe this. Now, the Rambam did believe in what's called Halacha Lemoshe Misinai, that there were a handful of laws. He limits it to 30 laws in his Hagdama to his Parish Mishnayot that were given in Har Sinai. He also believed that the 13 principles of exegesis were given in Har Sinai. And rabbis later on disagreed with those 30 laws, showing that even according to his understanding, because the Rambam said the, the way these laws must have been given on Har Sinai is because there were no dispute on them by the sages. But there's other rabbis who arose who showed that the sages did dispute on many of them, so they even broke the Rambam's mm. rule, saying that if the Rambam would have heard it, he would have believed it was less. However, in his Book of Commandments, in Sefer of Mitzvot, the command for believing in the oral law, he ties it to Deuteronomy chapter 17. And he reiterates this in the first chapter of Hilchus Mamrim. So when he had to justify it, he never said that the reason we believe in Tor Shabalpeh is because it was given on Har Sinai. He says that, that the reason we believe in it is because we're commanded in the prohibition of lo tasur, of not straying from what this court instructs us. That's it. That's the most practical reason. Mm -hmm. And every time I mentioned this to a Karite, they agreed. They're like, oh, for sure. But the mm -hmm. disagreement is whether the rabbis that appear in the Talmud are that group. That's a fair disagreement. Mm -hmm. I believe mm -hmm. they are that group in faith and historicity. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a question for the guy, Barry, in England. He's, as I say, he's a Karite, and he'd asked your opinion on, the, on that. So you know, thank you for that. Right. Okay. We have a question. Yep. We have a question from the chat. If I were to meet a completely irreligious woman in Tel Aviv and marry her, would their children be Jewish? And would he be committing a sin for marrying her? I'm assuming the person that asked the question is religious. So you've answered. If the woman had a Jewish mother, you mean? Oh, it just says a completely irreligious woman. I'm guessing the man was Jewish. I don't know. I think the If she's in Tel Aviv, yeah. we can assume that she was halakhali Jewish. All these laws regarding uh, people being put to death, who you can or cannot marry, are rabbinic. Now, I believe in rabbinic Judaism, but like the rabbis of the Talmud, we always have to make a distinction between what's from the Torah and what's from the rabbis. The notion that if your mother is Jewish, you're Jewish, is a rabbinic concept to be able to count people as, one, physically part of Israel, and two, liable to the punishments of the Sanhedrin. That's all it means by having a Jewish mother. In other words, you can be halachically, i.e. legally Jewish, according to the Sanhedrin, and not important to God in any way because you probably don't believe in God. In other words, you could be halachically Jewish and not in a covenant, and you can technically be in a covenant and not recognized as legally Jewish or halachically Jewish by other Jews. Okay, so this person said it was a debate with my yeshiva partner. Okay, so... If you marry a secular Jewish woman, it says the halakha uh, that their kiddushin is still valid, that a atheistical Jew, a kofer, someone could marry them and it's still a valid marriage. Because halakhically, being that marriage and kiddushin involves another person, it's not like you're marrying or having sex legally with a Gentile. 
But we're dealing with rabbinic Judaism. This has nothing to do with the Torah. I mean, the Torah clearly separates the world between those who are not in the covenant and those in the covenant, not between those who are halakhically Jewish and not halakhically Jewish. Well, he said because they are kegoi. So, uh, let's see. No, it says kegoi, but at the same time it says their kiddushin still valid. In other words, only because they're equivalent to a Gentile does it mean that they're not liable to the punishments of the Sanhedrin. Right, so for example, not- it says that someone who's Mechalel Shabbat, someone who desecrates the Sabbath, he has a status as Kegoi, like Shohan Aruch says, Kekuti, like a Samaritan. That doesn't mean that he's not going to be put to death by the court. Now, like if he was really fully a Gentile, then a Gentile is not put to death for not keeping the Sabbath. He would completely elude punishment. So he's halachically Jewish to receive Onesh, punishment. But is he in a covenant with God? No. Being Jewish has nothing to do with being in a covenant with God. There's people who go through a halachic conversion process, which allows them to halachically marry another Jew who really don't even believe in God. This is why sincerity and being what's called mekabela mitzvot, accepting the commandments upon yourself is not required for conversion. It says, yes, that we tell them some of the light mitzvot and some of the heavy mitzvot. But it says clearly that if you fail to investigate the person, the conversion is still valid. That if the person right after the conversion the person begins to worship idols again, he or she is still halakhically Jewish. Being halakhically Jewish is just a legal term. It has nothing to do with being in a covenant with God. And this is what I'm trying to tell people, that if you believe in Torah, if you love the individual moral training that appears in the books in Torah, don't let Jews discourage you, okay? I mean, it's a beautiful thing. I always teach that walking with God doesn't mean much if you're walking alone. Absolutely. Okay, but I think that should behoove you to try as hard as you can to build something where you're at, not encourage you to leave Torah. Torah doesn't belong to Israel. Torah belongs to whoever wants to keep it. That's it. So let's make a distinction between halacha and Torah, because Torah deals with you making an agreement, just like the Erev Rav and the Hebrews made an agreement, first accept and then keep Torah. That's it.